Firstly, welcome from me to um, a Music Teachers Association hosted webinar where we're going to be talking about self-evaluation and development plans. My name is Catherine Barker. Uh, if we haven't met before, hello, lovely to meet you. Even through the webinar, I can't see anyone's faces, but I just, I just believe you're all there out there somewhere on the internet. Um, my job is that I am head of music and performing arts for um, a group of schools called United Learning, which are both academies and uh, some independent schools as well, secondary and primary phase, right from Poole in the south and Carlisle in the north. So I spent a lot of time on the train, but I also spent a lot of time in schools. I'm really fortunate that I get a kind of a bird's eye view of lots of music education. I um, am music trained and also teach uh, drama as well. And I taught in, in London schools before I did this role in United Learning. Um, I'm also, um, I was on the expert panel for the National Plan. Um, so um, I was involved in some of the thinking behind this and listening to people and doing all the research. And I'll tell you more about how the plan was developed in a second, but I was quite closely involved with it. And I am uh, on the monitoring board as well for the National Plan. Uh, and we had our first meeting last week. So, yeah, lots to do in music education, as we all know. Um, other things that I do, I'm now president of the Music Teachers Association, which is a voluntary role. Um, music Teachers Association is one of the three subject associations around music, alongside Music Mark, who you've probably heard of, uh, who kind of spend a lot of their time kind of facing into hubs, but also they have um, schools as well who, who they um, support, and also the ISM, who are also a subject association. And our three organisations together are known as the Can Do Music partnership so hopefully reaching out to the the instrumental teachers music hubs into classroom teachers and all these other amazing people who work around um, music education sector in partnership just as the national plan asked us to do by working you know in hubs so that young people can get the best offer possible in the united kingdom well in england it's a particular i think interesting thing about um, music in this country and in the uk that it's structured in that way and that's why we do so well i think and punch above our weight nationally with music but we know it's not all rosy at the moment there's lots more to do with music education and it's not where we would want it to be and in fact it's going through quite a tough time so hence why the plan has been refreshed and uh we're looking at um development plans not um what they called SMEPs beforehand uh in the previous version of the plan so uh that's me i'm also a school governor uh, what else do I do? And I'm a parent, I've got children, and I'm a singer and a cellist, and I just love music and the arts. So that's me. Um, so the, the original plan was written about 11 years ago um, with the idea of um, putting a strategic plan behind music so that it could um, counteract some of the issues around the subject. And uh, it was announced by the, pre, by, by the current government that it would need to be refreshed, and that is what has happened. The original bit of research finding out what the context was happened just before the pandemic and then the work on the plan happened during the pandemic so really at quite a tough time in lots of ways and we've tried to reflect in the plan that there is a, an amount of kind of re-establishment of the subject that's been needed um music is the only subject with its own strategic plan i'll just let that land let that drop i think that's really um encouraging in lots of ways that it is something that the DfE and the ministers view as being important enough to have its own focus and not just important enough but it is complicated getting it right so it needs to have that care and attention brought to it and um, the I'll tell you a bit more um, in a second about the details within the new plan uh, but I think the process was very collaborative and uh, what was interesting about it was not only was there a panel of people from across the sector, but we also had the Department for Education kind of commissioning it and the DCMS, so the Culture and um, Sport Ministry, uh, kind of looking at it and helping us to make links with the wider sector and the professional, like, so all the progression routes are considered. So it's unusual in that sense. You don't normally get government departments working together in that way. And um, hopefully we get some good things out of it. Um, but so what did we get 
out of the national plan and hopefully I can move on. What we got was a really massive document and I'm, I'm sure many of you have had a happy day or a happy afternoon maybe with a cup of tea or something a bit more exciting and uh, wading through the kind of 80 page document plus case studies in appendix. It's really big. Um, but despite the length of this document, and there's loads of great stuff in there, by the way, I don't want to undermine the nature of the document. I think it is a powerful statement about what the vision for music education could be in schools and academies in England. But um, despite that length, I think it does offer quite a lot of clarity. It is broadly in three sections. The first section is goes from sort of cradle to end of school. So early years right up to the kind of the end of the, um, the life cycle in education. Then the second section is about the hub partnerships and the final section is about kind of the broader partnerships. So it tries to kind of work it in a logical sequence. And there are moments in it where it offers absolute clarity. And I think this is the clarity bit that I always go straight for is it outlines what are the key features of high quality school music provision? What should every child be entitled to across the country? And I don't think there's anything um, controversial about this. It's a simple statement, a starting point for conversations with schools. So um, schools can say, well, we haven't got this yet. Why not? Or even better, how can we make this possible? So I just rattle through this list of seven as a starting point, because when we're doing a development plan for a subject, whilst we're thinking about um, a SIP, a school improvement plan, and therefore the offset framework, probably, which is what your skip, SIP will be um, related to, there are these things that if you don't have them going in your school, these are the things that should be prioritised. I'm going to say should because the whole document is one of those DFE documents, but it should. If it was in a United Learning School, I would feel must. This is like the bread and butter of what young people need. So we need to have a timetable curriculum. Um, it may be drawing on the insights of the model music curriculum, but it needs to be as least as ambitious as the national curriculum. And that has to take place regularly so that we can build up skills and knowledge over time. And that is expected from key stage one all the way to the end of key stage three. So apologies, this session is going to be quite secondary focused just because um, I felt that that is what was needed. There's been quite a lot of work by hubs looking at primary music. So this session is on secondaries, but I'm sure if you're a primary music leader, you'll get lots about this as well because it's the seven key features are no, uh, needed in both. Then uh, the second point, access of, to lessons across a range of instruments and voice. We know that the, for a lot of young people and for families, the school is the gatekeeper for, for provision. It doesn't mean that we're, we can, you have to offer, you know, everything from, you know, violin right to sousaphone and everything in the middle. But for the opportunity to be there and also to point out the pathways for progression, to know where they can go to, to support in making those links. It's really important for families. And we know there has been increased interest in instrumental um, take up and one to one lessons and small group lessons since the plans published, which is great. Schools also, um, uh, it's a high quality school music department will have a choir or vocal ensemble and an ensemble or band or some kind of group that young people can engage with. That's recognising that symbiotic relationship between the curriculum offer and the co-curricular. And what we know is the students who do the best in Key Stage 4, the best in Key Stage 5, are the ones who are building up their hours of uh, musical expertise by being involved in those ensembles and those activities. And the better they get, then the, the curriculum starts really firing on all cylinders as well. So you can't have really have one without the other. And in fact, if you prioritise one at the expense of the other, then things also get out of, out of kilter. You, know, you spend too much time uh, in the practice room supporting the bands and then you don't have time to plan your curriculum properly. So there's a delicate balance to be had. But we also know that great music departments can't work without space. Space is so important. For, for me personally, that is about social justice. You know, if you live in um, housing um, where you don't have your own bedroom or you don't, um, you know, have, if you live in a flat or even if you don't have the instruments, if you're a drummer and you don't have a drum kit, how on earth are you going to get better? How are you going to practice without that facility being available to you at school? And practice rooms, I say this a lot, practice rooms make great offices. So we have to be really careful and remind schools and senior teams, what happens when you take these things away, what the outcome will be. 
So, um, and, and that's why, you know, schools are designed with, with this space in mind. So we have to maintain that for our departments to help the health of the, of the subject and opportunities for young people, of course. Um, Tony performance is in there on the key features. I'm preaching to the choir here with you guys on this webinar, I'm sure. But we know that um, pro musical progress is not just about um, the process, but also about the product. So having those milestones, those landing points for performance are really important to, to head towards, but also to see what the older students are doing to celebrate the younger students on their journey as well, on their musical journey. So termly performance is really a vital part of a high quality and thriving provision. And finally, Finally, uh, the opportunity for young people to enjoy live performance is also at the heart of this, particularly for those young students. I honestly lost track of the number of times people have come to me and said, I had never heard an orchestra until I went on a school trip when I was X years old and it totally blew my mind. Or it might be, you know, I went, I got taken to the Music for Youth Festival or, you know, I, a local community choir. We did a shared concert with them. And really that can open your eyes to what's out there and um, obviously we've got Glastonbury as well which you can see but it's not quite the same when you see it in person it's just something about that connection that very human connection which can really ignite passion for the subject so those are those key features now many schools find this really really straightforward but I think some do find it challenging especially primary schools and smaller schools so we have to be alive to that um, and I think the sector we hope are trying to sort of step in with some of this stuff, especially the live performance element and the performance, you know, instead of shared performances. And certainly we think about that as a trust. And the other thing I think is a deficit in this list is that there's no mention about progression routes. If you're in a secondary school, you pretty much expect the school to offer a key stage four. And if it didn't have a key stage four, you'd be for me that wouldn't be a high quality department so and I think that would also if you look at the um, Ofsted research reviews and other content from Ofsted I think they would share that view that it hasn't made it into the plan uh, but something to keep in mind because it is about progression routes after all okay so let's have a look um, a bit more about what is in there there's other things to keep in mind uh, the plan talks about the necessity for subject leadership, partly because of the complex nature of music. Um, you need to have um, someone to look at the direction of the subject and also be um, liaising with any instrumental staff, peri teachers, etc. having a relationship with the hub, um, these freelance staff who might be working with your school. And that also uh, that always needs quite a lot of support. But as a small subject, small subjects also need support and nurture so it's important that there is clear leadership for the uh, for the subject and that's recognized schools are also being asked to produce music development plans which is what today is about and they should be in place by september 2023 now hopefully that is very much in the normal planning cycle of your school and uh, the school development plan shouldn't just be about outcomes I i'm going to go straight to the heart of that because um, I have seen many, many development plans over the um, over my career, which have been extremely focused on um, data. And I think that is something that I think Ofsted has begun to move away from a little bit, especially with the new inspection um, framework. Um, but it, it needs to be much more in the language of school improvement. So capturing that, the curricular offer and the co-curricular offer and setting out, you know, how you're going to do it, how you can achieve it, how is it going to be funded, particularly, that might be a live issue for you to think about. So uh, we'll go on and I promise I will get to the nitty gritty when we'll start looking at development plans in a second, but I've got to just lay out the context. And finally, um, there will be some lead schools um, in place uh, for each hub region, and they will be working in partnership with the hub on CPD training and peer-to-peer -peer support. There's more information to come about this in 2023. Now, given that the new hub partnerships won't be set and decided until April 2024, so in case you've missed the memo on this, don't worry, totally fine. Uh, we're going from a large number of hubs to smaller number of hubs which cover bigger areas. So once that's all been shaken down you can imagine that that's like the hubs are really thinking hard about that at the moment it's a lot of tricky work for them but once that's shaken down then the lead schools i'm sure will be asked to apply or approach maybe different regions will do it in different ways there has been an if you're interested in that the arts council have produced a guidance document for that i just if you just google it i'm sure you'll find it um but there's more information to come i guess for me the big question will be will there be any money 
about that. And um, I know some schools will be really excited in that. If you're a really great department um, with, you know, quite a big team and loads of exciting things happening, you might think, oh, this would be a really good way of like continuing our, our journey and, and extending our, our reach and having impact beyond your school. What an amazing thing to do. Um, and, and maybe the status. But we have to be really clear about the rationale for the lead schools. Um, it's for having impact beyond your setting to exemplify CPD, to share your practice so that you can, can contribute to the hub partnership. A bit like in the maths um, hubs and behaviour hubs and languages hubs. So just to keep that in mind is, you know, it's about development um, of other schools and, and their staff. Right. So. If you would like a summary for the plan, you should be able to click into the, the little link here, but also you can find it on the Music Teachers Association website. We've kind of done a reduced plan, which you might want to share with your senior leaders. So that's where you can find that. You've probably already seen it last summer because the plan was published about a year ago. And uh, the other thing we've done, which is what we're mostly going to look at today, is we put together a self-evaluation tool uh, designed to be used by your teachers and leaders as you're kind of reflecting on your own provision so you can identify where you might need to develop and how you might do that so for the next part of this session where are we now 20 past five not doing too bad for the next part of this session we are going to start the development plan process so i can kind of do a guided reflection with you really to help you map out um, how you might build on your provision in the as we go into this first kind of full year of the plan. Just to note, the national plan is um, it's a 10 year um, plan um, to be reviewed at, at that next point. And it wouldn't be realistic to try and address everything in your school next year. Like any sort of plan, it needs to be kind of smart, as they say, isn't it? So um, it, as a starting point. It'll always be about prioritizing what are your kind of most immediate needs and then the long term view, because, you know, most of our departments are really small. So we've got to be kind to ourselves, take it bit by bit and uh, yeah, aim to build gradually over time. And the plan is not going anywhere. We hope I'm not going to say anything political because I'm being recorded, but we would anticipate that um, the national plan will still be in post uh, no matter what is happening uh, kind of um, in, in at the DfE. So, and while you're, you, I assume you're, these are school music leads who are joining us today, um, you're likely to be the owner of this plan, just like you would be the owner of your de department development plan, but there are other people who will, um, can contribute to it um, so that it's really useful and it's owned by your school. So you might want to have some input from students, have some people voice on this. You might want to have a 360, you know, with your senior leaders. You might want to talk to your governors about it. You might even want to talk to parents about your plan um, and conversations with people like me in an academy trust or even your hub a schools link um, member of staff can also help you identify areas of development and opportunities for the great partnership work that we would hope would happen um, across our schools and uh, the wider sector. So what is in the plan and what's in the tool? Let's have a look. So in the self-evaluation tool, we've done two things. The first thing, have a look on the probably the right hand side of your screen in the circle in the box is to kind of draw out what are the aspects referred to in the national plan that take uh, that are relevant to classroom provision, things that are relevant to beyond the classroom, i.e. the co-curricular space, things that are relevant to community and partnerships, and then things that are re relevant to leadership and management. And Elizabeth Olner, you have got a gold star because you've put right in the chat. Can you send a link to the summary? Thank you very much. And equally, you might want to link directly to the self-evaluation tool. If somebody could do that, because I'm juggling a couple of screens and I'm just not, I'm just not clever enough to do that. If somebody could do that, that'd be super helpful. Amazing. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, and so we've done that. We've we've kind of taken the detail of the plan and put it into the self-evaluation tool. And then we said, okay, well, not everybody is gonna be doing everything straight away. So how can we kind of chart it out step-by-step, step, a curriculum sequence, if you may, just like uh, they love at Ofsted, rightly so. Um, what would it look like? How can you look at your own provision and work out where you are and how you can get to the next steps? So we've taken those four aspects and we've decided what might be a focusing, like the starting point. If your curriculum is just starting off, what does it look like? 
what is developing. So if your enrichment provision is more than focusing, if you're beginning to build and you're getting some good activity, what does that look like? Secure, say for example, you've got loads of links with a, with a hub and you're doing work in the community and there's all sorts of volunteering and things going on. That might be your community partnerships. And leadership and management. If you were one of those um, hub lead schools, I wanted to call them champion schools, but they're not going to be called that. They're going to be called lead schools. If you're a lead school, you might be enhancing. So let me go through and talk you through bit by bit. And this is where you might want to have a piece of uh, paper and a pencil and start to think yourself, like, how do you compare? How do you measure uh, yourself against what um, about, against the plan? and these potential areas, focusing, developing, secure, and enhancing. To be clear, I think secure is kind of like, yes, you're, you're winning. Enhancing is you, you know, the nationally relevant um, work that will be pretty unusual. But of course, you've got to have it in there because we're really ambitious, aren't we? But be kind to yourself. You know, don't always go for enhancing. It's good to just have that stepwise thing on the roadmap. Okay. Let's start off by looking in the classroom. And none of this should be a particular surprise, again, if, if you're quite familiar with things like the Ofsted framework. So a school that was focusing, this is, um, uh, I see this in schools where maybe they've had issues with staffing and things have been stripped back. You know, the national curriculum is not being delivered. Not many students um, deliver vocational courses. You know, they might have a carousel curriculum, for example. Um, there's not much um, kind of, uh, progress is not being carefully measured either um, or reflect on how that might impact curriculum planning and the space for teaching is is quite weak so you know broken instruments and like rooms and rooms and rooms of desks uh, or loads of desks everywhere and not like lots of like really rich music making taking place within the curriculum of course, once it's developing, it's in the timetable, full schemes of work assessment in place. This is where we'd all want to be as a, as a kind of minimum, really. Um, all students are able to access the full curriculum and the progression routes are in place for Key Stage 4 or Key Stage 5. SEND, students with SEND can participate and engage with music making. And there is adequate space. It's enough for for um, teaching and you've got the resources you need and you might have a, a set of tuned and untuned and some music tech. So that would be kind of like the minimum in my view. Now, if I was doing this, if I was watching this webinar, I'd be sitting there with my cup of coffee and I'd be kind of maybe circling and ticking and I'd be thinking, oh, I'll just write a note with examples of how I'm doing that. But I might also be tempted to look into the security category to think, is there anything in here that I am doing at least as ambitious as the national curriculum, drawing on insights from the model music curriculum? To be clear, not meaning you actually teach a model music curriculum, but you might have reviewed your curriculum with that in mind or taken some of the repertoire suggestions you don't have to teach the full thing I just want to be clear with that weekly lessons in place weekly is really important as I said earlier clear curriculum sequence all of this is very much in the language of our inspectorate um, and maybe a breadth of courses on offer enough young people so there's academic and vocational potentially but definitely there are, there's um, pathways for students that are appropriate to them and their needs. And uh, particularly for sixth form study, being aware of what the local offer is, both in your own setting and what might be available locally. Maybe there's a great college nearby that has a fantastic music technology course that some of your learners would be really interested in. Um, and good progress taking place being demonstrated by secure and incremental learning of the technical, constructive and expressive aspects of music. I think you'll find that's familiar from the Offset Research Review, but it's about thinking about um, developing musical understanding, not just a series of musical um, activities. Um, the other thing that we'd expect that in a, in a really secure department, a very established department, is a, a, a department that has built up resource over time. And that would be, for, for example, for resources for SEND, and uh, for all young people, so there is real quality for the breadth of the curriculum offer. And finally, enhancing, of course, goes beyond that. Now, I'll just leave you that to land a little bit. I've had a question in the chat, which I'm going to go straight to. Is this the self-evaluation we do ourselves? You're a trainee and haven't seen this before. Now, this self-evaluation is completely optional. Is there as a, as a kind of benchmarking tool for departments to be able to um, look at their provision and uh, recognise their strengths? 
and maybe identify where they could go next. So if you feel your subject is developing, if your department, your music department is developing um, because you've got a timetable, you've got a curriculum in place, but maybe students aren't really developing musical understanding, you might be more in developing and need to think about how you can get to that secure place. How are you going to do that? Oh God, that's a whole other, other um, can of worms. But this is for, about reflection. The, the development bit comes next, okay? Um, so I worked on this uh, with some teachers this year and they looked at it and they said, actually, we need to really focus on our work with students with um, SEND to make sure they progress well, because actually they looked at their data um, at Key Stage 4 and noticed that their students with SEND were not doing as well based on their starting points, not making as much progress. And also they recognised within their provision that they weren't, um, planning enough for composition as a way of developing musical understanding and that was also having an impact at their outcomes um, at key stage four and key stage five so they were wanting to plan uh, more the sequence of composition within their offer so hopefully that gives you an example of kind of things that might come out of this sort of review so i'll just pause for a minute and maybe you might write down for yourself where do you think your priorities could be next year If you feel bold, you might want to share it in the chat. I'm not going to be like posting the chat online or recording it or anything. Um, and it might just be interesting for other people to see um, the kind of um, things that people are thinking about. Um, you might be interested. Oh, no, I'll talk about my own thing. Next, next slide. Mike Wright has asked about MTA HODs to visit other departments. I'm sure you can reach out to other members. Um, exciting news from September is that we will have a fully digitized membership database, so it will be much easier to make links with local um, members. This webinar is, has been extended to members and non-members. I'll talk about membership at the end, don't worry. But yeah, Mike, um, I'm sure we'd, uh, you'll be able to find people through the membership from September onwards. And if you do want to just reach out, the best thing to do is just email um, Keith or Sophie or Jill, and uh, people can make links. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next section. So that's talking about um, uh, the secondary classroom offer. Mm, interesting, Elizabeth, to hear you're moving to another school. That's always a, a great moment, full of opportunity, but also risk. So um, exciting times for you. Okay, let's go on to thinking about beyond the classroom so i.e co-curricular and this is something that i'm thinking about quite a lot in our trust next year because um, it can be uh, when you get it right it's brilliant but it can be quite challenging so focusing is as you would expect this is kind of like the not ideal scenario hardly any singing limited numbers of um, performances there might be barriers so um You'd love to do a school concert, but, you know, you can't use the hall at the end of the day because you, you're in a PFI building and you can't use your own site. I do see things like that. It's quite shocking, actually. Um, facilitation of one-to-one um, -one and small group tuition is limited, inconsistent, loads of absence from staff. You can't get the staff that you need. Um, the students don't turn up to lessons, <laughs> etc. Some of that's quite normal, but, um, you know, there needs to be a plan in place to address it, at least. Um, and the club's programme being very limited and students, even if their offer is limited, they're not even being signposted to the activities. And um, that feels really sad to me because obviously we can't do everything, but uh, we can um, signpost to what's available and uh, hub partnerships um, do an awful lot, but we don't always know what it is. So it's within our gift. If, if it's not asked, then who? We need to go and find these things out and, and make sure that we all work together and help each other. So let's go straight into the developing um, section. Singing and vocal work is frequent in the curriculum and beyond and with varied repertoire. That's really important, isn't it, to make sure that we can go from sort of, uh, I'm being very reductive, karaoke backing tracks to, you know, uh, individual singing right to part singing to you know something that may be more stretching choral repertoire not that that's the absolute zenith for for singing work but you know what I mean like building real expertise um, and skill all pupils can perform complete inclusion and that um, should be regularly so thinking about what the barriers how can you work with your your TAs your your, your senko to make sure that all young people can be included and musical events take place 
termly, um, as I explained earlier, really uh, critical to make sure that there's that enlivening of your curriculum and co-curricular. Let's go straight across. So if you if that's happening, musical performance may begin to be a really prominent component of the school life. So if you can take it to the next level, it, will, it is going to be secure, isn't it? If you've got music and assemblies and performances, collaborating with other subjects, maybe um, school productions in performing arts, getting involved in local events, your music hub um, performances or local festivals. There's lots of things around um, the scope around there, like rotary festivals and all sorts of things going on. And in school music events taking place twice a term. I know lots of schools that I work with who do these fabulous live land concerts. Um, they have a real variety. So low stakes and more high stakes events, some that are more formal, some that are more informal. All of that helps to, um, uh, to kind of grow grow the interest and opportunities for um, a full range of young people uh, because a formal concert isn't for everyone but informal also you know doesn't quite you know sometimes might not take them to the next place either um talking about instrumental provision what would it be like what does it look like if it's um working really well well um here it's again it's about inclusion so pupils and families facing barriers are given support to engage in musical learning um really um, thinking about you know again how can we take away these barriers for, for young people and then if you think about the co-curricular space uh, when um, schools do this really well um, the not only is it working well in school because there's a, a vocal ensemble or an instrumental ensemble but the local opportunities are also being signposted and that should be if it's secure tracked monitored how many young people are taking part What's a split of girls, boys? What's your free school meals um, data in this area? What about send young people? And you might think then be talking to young people and find out, oh, oh we'd well, really like to have a, you know, actually like the vocal ensemble to be a bit more progressive. Um, how can we do that? How can we bring, you know, some beatboxing, some spoken word into that? And many, many other examples that I've seen from young people um, where they've been more um, co-curating um, their provision or, or, you know, all of this allows you to target the provision more effectively. Um, because, for example, if you don't have a lot of um, one type of learner in your school taking part, you probably need to go and talk to them and find out what are the barriers? What, what's, what's stopping them? Um, because it, to assume that your normal kind of the standard out of the box offer is for everybody, it's maybe missing a bit of a trick. Um, and the best schools um, really take that to the next level. They're not just um, nurturing those students and they start their journey, but as they go through their journey musically, joining the local and regional ensembles um, in the in the county or the wider area and nudging them carefully and supportively into national ensembles where appropriate to. So. Um, I think that covers everything in there. Or, of course, going to the enhancing, that's a, quite a bit more stretching. I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. And I'm just going to hear, uh, pop on here, things that I thought about with teachers. Across my whole trust next year, we're having another big focus on singing. We did loads of this um, before, the, uh, before the pandemic, but of course, it's been more challenging since then. And um, all of our schools, if there's a United Learning School on the call, this is a this is um, spoilers, increase our frequency of singing as a way of building musicianship across the department and, uh, you know, establishing more repertoire, uh, kind of trying to enliven what we're doing and, and tap into the curriculum as well as ensemble music making. Um, and also uh, the progression of ensembles is something that we're thinking about quite a lot in our trust and really trying to raise awareness and um, support for students as they go to those next progression routes, because we can't do everything in schools when our departments also um, maybe are a bit stretched in what they're delivering. So that's how we're thinking about it in United Learning, and that will go into our development plan. I'll give you a couple of minutes to just have a think. You can tune into the bit of thinking I'm gonna do here, or you can just do your own um, planning in the background. I've had a question in the chat. Natasha, by termly, are we talking about full term, i.e. three per year, or half terms, six per year? Obviously, six ideal, but I worry my school would be reluctant. That's a really good point. So I'll kind of answer that question with a question. I know that's really annoying, but I'm going to do it. I'm so sorry. Um, does every performance need to be a high stakes performance, I suppose, is my starting question. And there are many levels in between from your um, 
I suppose sharing in class actually that's quite high stakes for <laughs> sharing to your peer group but performing to your teachers usually the teachers are the ones who love hearing you to perform performing to parents does it have to be the whole school hall or within the classroom or performing to friends an invited audience lunchtime lives as I said or um informal after school concerts master classes like a live lesson we know that work I mean I can remember doing that at music college and at school and it was always really powerful actually those are probably the toughest ones aren't they toughest performances master class ones and um, right up to the big school production the one that you spend like months on and hours and hours of rehearsal and you're pulling your hair around it makes you go gray um and everything in between to think quite carefully and creatively also about which what might be right for different learners, different stages. I think one school concert is just, it's high stakes and also might be quite a lot for, you know, year, year, year sevens, but also for year 11s, it might not be a progression for them. So something to think about. Um, obviously, if you're doing performance every week, that's loads of work for you, which is not great, probably for your well-being, um, And also the quality will reduce. So also being really mindful that anything you put out there publicly in front of your senior leaders you want to that's your shot window that's your work on the wall like in the art department so you'd want to think carefully about that but if it's within the, the confines of the department and it's sharing I think that that can take place quite regularly um would be my view and that's what I see from the best uh, departments that, that I work with um some other questions um Delta are taking over my new school. I don't know who Delta are, but that's exciting. Um, they are wanting to do half hour music lessons on the timetable instead of a usual week or a carousel system. Oh dear. Well, um, I can't support um, on that specifically. That does sound like quite a challenging situation, but I would remind them of the expectation of the national plan um, and also um, on the um, uh, offset framework, because I think you're really going to be hard pushed to um deliver a breadth of curriculum that would be in line with the expectations of the Ofsted framework with that amount of curriculum time um, and it's always worth reminding people about that um, okay so that is beyond the classroom so we've spoken about the two things the symbiotic relationship and we've now got 20 minutes left of the next two perfect hopefully you've got a little list don't have too many just maybe a couple for each as a starting point okay so let's think about leadership and management. This is actually an area of the Ofsted framework, isn't it? The leadership and management. And I don't think there's anything groundbreaking in here. Um, you know, if a school was only just uh, starting out in their music journey, they might have named someone to be in post. They've had a bit of training, but it's not really having impact. So we don't want to be in there. We want to be in the developing. A named, trained subject lead in post and collaborating with colleagues across the school. That's really important um, because. Uh, you need, as a music teacher, to build so much, um, or you need to advocate for your subject, um, and uh, not advocate in a kind of lobbying sense, but you are the spokesperson for the department, and often you can't do everything on your own, and uh, you will need to collaborate with your drama colleagues and um, the head of year 11, because they'll want a performance at the um, Leavers Assembly, and the year seven, because they'll want something in the transition um, moment, and, and all of that other stuff. Maybe head of RE, if you work in a faith school, you're going to do all that sort of stuff. So you're not an island. And actually, that's the richness. That's why we work in schools and we don't work in offices, because we want to work with people, <laughs> typically. Um, but it's really important to reiterate that fact that um, as a music teacher, it's quite an unusual role that you will interface with loads of people across the school. PE do it quite a bit, but we do it a lot too. Um, and... Uh, you can't do that on your own. Uh, you do need to be supported by a subject, a senior leader advocate in your school. So your line manager and probably beyond that, there tends to be um, like in, in really good schools, they'll have someone on the SLT who is like the link for those subjects. And that person should and must really be aware of the national plan so they can support with the delivery of it um, and making sure it actually happens. But good uh, to be great leaders and to be great um, uh leaders of music making and uh, musical learning um training and cpd is really important and that should then have an um, impact on your outcomes and um in all when, when that's all working really well the music staff really shut that sh stick out in a school often because they are clear advocates for music and they model musical behaviors all the time so they're acting musically in lessons being musical um uh, advocating for for musicianship at every point so that's quite ambitious, doesn't it, for developing? But 
there is always more that can happen, I think, in leadership. Um, so specifically referring to music in a, in a school improvement plan, I'm seeing that more and more as schools get more aware of the national plan. The local governing body taking a special interest in subject provisions. No surprise why I ended up getting involved in governance because I wanted to drive provision in a particular school and um, staff to invest in, in the development uh, time um, with their CPD, that also having an impact on the rest of school. That might be, you know, all directions. So um, educating your senior team about what great music looks like and all supporting your peri staff with um, teaching and learning and, and everything in between. So that would be a really secure department in an, a department that is really cooking on gas. And I think a lot of schools can get there on this. A five year strategic vision for music. That takes quite a lot of thinking, but it's worth doing because it gives you that roadmap for improvement. And um, for schools who are also doing really well, they they will be in a position where they can share their learning. I was at the MTA conference a few weeks ago and we had a fabulous we had many teachers sharing the fantastic work they're doing in their schools um like greg from um the arc school down in greenwich who's doing whole class instrumental provision if you ever get a chance to hear about that school it'll just it'll blow your mind it'll be really inspiring but there are many teachers out there who are sharing the great work they're doing and many of them involved in the nta which we are deeply grateful for so that's about leadership and management about your subject uh, your role as a subject lead and Simply, the, a lot of the teachers that I've been working with in the past few weeks and months have been thinking about actually they do need to make sure that their senior team are aware of um, the, the national plan and the kind of the, the level of ambition and also how music fits within the national and local context. Because it does take a while to get your, hub around, your head around, particularly hubs. That's why I, I was thinking about hubs when I, when I misspoke then. Um, it's complex. Who's responsible for what? What should we be doing? What should the hub be doing? What are the national organisations, national the NIMOs, the National Youth Music Organisations, responsible for? What's the DFE responsible for? It's all in there. It's all in the plan. Okay, so this is your chance to just write down a few notes. What you might do? Maybe it's around training. Maybe it's around CPD. I can see. Um, I can't see any more questions in the chat, but I can see that Helen has got a raised hand. Helen, would you mind popping that into the chat just because I can't easily take you off mute while I'm on this screen share, but I'm really happy to answer questions. And any other questions, just chuck them in. I wouldn't say I'm the, the sage, but it's that, let's use hive mind, right? There's going to be a lot of people on this call who do have the answers. Um, and if we don't have the answers, I might be able to put you in touch with someone who does. So any questions, just pop them in the chat. Okay, let's move on. The last area of the evaluation tool asks us to reflect on how our music departments um, work um, in their community or face out into the community and, and the partnerships you may have. And one of those really important partnerships could be with your local music education hub or whatever that music education hub is from April 2024. Um, but, you know, a school that's focusing will might have limited engagement with the hub. Um, I think some schools uh, and teachers have pushed back at me on this and said well I've tried but they're not offering me anything this point now with the national plan is the point where you try again because they are being um you know really uh like tasked with um increasing their support for schools so bang on the door again and and in fact going with you know like an open heart and open mind is that if it hasn't happened before now have a, give it another go, because I think everybody is hopefully just got that little injection um, for new opportunities and, and sort of like starting with a clean slate. It's always good to do that. Um, so take up opportunities from the hub and find out what's going on there and tell your students about it, because they don't hear it from you. They're probably not going to hear it from anywhere else. Um, and uh, as you're going, if it maybe you're only um, focusing your performances in schools, um, might be um, small scale. So I'm thinking those small wins like uh, um, going to, yeah, taking like five kids down to a local care home. We used to do this before the pandemic, but some people are now doing it, which is great. Um, and some of your parents are making links to the department, but maybe not all. So, you know, it's the kind of school offer maybe where, you know, you get to the end of the school concert and all the cars turn up at the end. You think, oh, you should have been here at the beginning. You want to hear them, the kids are great. Um, and building on that really is just kind of on a, on, on a scale from there, as you'd expect. So community links being established, events taking place throughout the school year. Um, I have a school in Manchester, William Hume Grammar School. It's just 
fab school in United Learning and they have a sustained partnership with um, an elders um, social club and over the year they they do performances for them in the school actually like tea parties which is really lovely it's just like a great volunteering opportunity for young people and uh, yeah it, it, it's it's really valued by by the elders who, who join them. Um, and that can grow as you go into secure and then of course into enhancing. Let's think about parents, you know, um, of course, we want support from parents at events and in, in some communities that kind of goes without saying, but actually it goes further in in, in some places and, and can be really powerful. So, you know, do your, are your parents able to um, share their views on the music provision and um, to give you feedback? Um, can they be actively involved in school music making? That has been a really strong offer in many education settings. Um, you know, parent choirs, parent ensembles, parents joining in. A school in Cambridge that I work with, they do a 24 hour musicathon, 24 hours in the music department. Wow. And uh, when they've done that, they have run rehearsals for the parents to come to and the students have coached their parents. Um, so there's all sorts of things that you can do when you're creative and you're feeling kind of um, excited and ambitious about partnership work. Um, but partnership work often starts with your local music education hub who can help you with events and links to your local universities and careers links and all that kind of stuff that goes on and um your local music education hub sarah not a stupid question is absolutely fine um would depend on what region you are in in the country there is a list of them on the arts council website just google it but um uh, sarah if you say what where you are in the country i might be tell you be able to tell you what your hub is um, so just add that in the chat and I'll see if I can point you in the right direction. So it'll be Nottingham Music Education Hub. Just, just search that. Now, what's the complicated thing with hubs is that some of them might be linked to your local authority. Um, so like your lo local council and some of them are not. Um, the hub is like the lead organisation for all the organisations who are involved in delivering music education. So that might be the music service or it might be um uh like a, a brass bands community organization or it might be a cathedral music trust all sorts of different things all of those together that makes them local music education hub hopefully that helps sarah oh there we go rachel legend thank you so much okay so thinking about all these things again um i was talking to a school uh, not long ago and they were thinking about what they might need to do and they recognized that they needed a bit more parent carer support partly because actually engagement in music in the it's like links back to the the earlier part of the self-evaluation framework they didn't feel that engagement in music was that strong so they actually thought we, if we could engage parents better it might raise the value of the subject so they need to develop better links and they wanted to build partnership community links. Not too much to do there. I would worry that would be too many targets if that was in my development plan in one year. I might just choose one of those. Okay. Hopefully you've had a chance to think about what might be relevant to you. Of course, this is not like, you know, have to do this all now. Probably between now and the end of term, so it's ready for September, is I guess what your schools might be expecting. Okay, so now you've got all of this, you kind of thought about um, the areas you'd like to prioritise underneath these headings. And you might need to consider which ones are most important, which ones will have the biggest impact, which of them are the easy wins, you know, like showing the senior leader the national plan, that should be a quick one, email it across, have a chat. Um, but some of them are going to be harder and will be longer areas of development. And you might want to actually put some things into year two or year three or over a couple of years, so you can be kind to yourself. You, know, you can't do everything in one go. And school improvement planning often is sort of in that uh, in that way as well. You know, if you're going to, um, you know, aim towards uh, outstanding or you know really great results, you can't do that in a year. It does take time. So, what it, I thought with these um, particular priority areas that I made, I'd be thinking about, okay, what are the kind of actions that I could do and how long will it take me to do them? Um, and based on the work that I see schools do. And I made some suggestions. This is going to be shared with you, by the way, in PDF. So you don't have to like write all of this down. We'll share it all um, tomorrow uh, via email. 
but just some, you know, some really easy actions, not easy, but straightforward and quite clear um, so that they're um, smart, so they're manageable and, and all of that kind of super measurable um, and time specific. Um, and being clear, you know, what things I'm going to do straight away in term one, what's going to happen in every term, one, two and three, what will start and then move on. So I suppose what are the interesting ones? Um, yeah, progression in ensembles. Not just sharing via email, but in every concert program, having note like a, a comment about where young people can go to go and find other music making and sharing that with families so they can read it. Um, you might also want to list it on your school music website, that kind of stuff. Um, making links with parents. We're going to have informal tea time concerts with Perry's. That was one thing I was talking to a school about. And they were going to create more guides for their parents. Like what, what should you expect in terms of pra practice? Um, and yeah, so all these things seem to be, I think, quite straightforward particularly the singing one um th there is something there is that's like ongoing cpd isn't it in development you can't just crack singing in an instant so it part of it is about research individual work that you're going to need to do but then like perhaps we want to do the research research what can you hold yourself to um okay i think what's manageable to do three songs a term we can put, build that into repertoire and that's year one and the next year you can do more songs and, and grow grow that's how it works we sort of keep going throughout our whole careers and we never stop growing and developing um, so that's some thinking of the kind of actions you could have following your development, your reflection, going to a development plan. But you might be being asked, be being asked at the moment to write a development plan as part of a school improvement process, particularly if you're um, in a state school or not in an independent school. And your school improvement plan will will most typically link to the Ofsted framework. Now, um, what I've done here is sort of look at the Ofsted framework and say, well, how does the national plan or those areas in self-evaluation kind of fit under those headings? So we know that quality of education, that's all the curriculum stuff, intent, implementation, impact, like what are you planning for? How are you doing it? And how do you know it's working, essentially? Um, I think enrichment does have a very strong role to play in that because it's part of the offer and essential offer for young people i think it should be seen as most as important as curriculum um the offset framework kind of pops it into personal development which i'll talk about in a second the other thing that does come under quality of education in the offset framework is our teachers um given the, the time and the expert do they have the expertise in order to teach the curriculum so somehow leadership management does also map into quality of education um, behavior and attitudes, that's an interesting one in Offset. That's kind of like the feel of the school, you know, are students following their expectations? Is it a nice environment? But there are some things that link to the music, music provision. Of course, the environment in your music lessons, but there are some things that um, you might want to focus on in the plan. So attendance, not just to lessons, but on attendance to your co-curricular provision. I think that somehow links to attitudes and also um, are students able to be heard on their views of um, musical learning and the environment um, and the, the culture around music in the school? I think that is covered in behaviour and attitudes. Personal development, this is the co-curricular stuff um, that um, Ofsted is uh, really interested in. Um, just to note that this is a kind of a non-impact um, judgment. This is more of a kind of what are you doing judgment, which uh, I think is a little bit contentious, but that's what it is in the framework. So anything about um, the co-curricular, the beyond the classroom, and also community and partnerships slots really nicely into the personal development category. And of course, leadership management does what it says on the tin. So if I was taking the previous evaluation, and thinking where it might fit into categories on a SIP or an officer framework. Outcomes for SEND, you know, there's a thing about SEND planning, that would be in quality of education, and the composition um, uh, targets would be around quality of education, and so on. Um, interestingly, I feel that singing, especially for developing musicianship and ensemble like cohesion, I think that somehow links into behaviour and attitudes as well. It's about, you know, bringing your best self, um, participation, engagement, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I won't labour this because of time, but this is a way that you could think about how uh, self-evaluation, the music development plan can link quite clearly to a, a school improvement plan, and uh, which, which no doubt is linked to the offset framework. As I said, this is all going to be shared afterwards. Now, having done all of that thinking, 
we mustn't forget these seven key features because if one of these is missing it should be part of your development plan um, to address it these really are at the heart of a strong music offer for children and young people and just think if this was the the offer for every school in the country we would just have so much better equity of provision address a lot of the social justice that sits around um, music and diversity issues there are around music education so I really implore you as, as a group of brilliant professionals who've given up their five till six o'clock on a Monday evening uh, to, to think about development plans to really like have this in your mind I haven't printed off and I just look at it and I think right this is this is what we're all aiming for guys Let, let's go for it because there's no there's no time to spare for, for children they just get that one chance in schools and if if we can't um bring it for them then then who will so with that call to arms i'll begin to finish the session uh, if you have any questions you can type them in the chat you can also just find me um either katherine.barker at unitedlearning.org.uk or the president I'm very excited about that. President at musicteachers.org. Um, I don't get many emails on the president account. So yeah, email me, say hi. It'd be lovely to hear from you. You can find out more about the NTA by clicking on the link in here, musicteachers.org. Um, as one of the one subject associations around music, we offer, here we go, big breath, in-person conference, which is fab. Lots of online CPD, just like this one. We have a magazine three times a year called Ensemble, which is full of amazing stuff networking and peer support we also have a regular podcast which you can find in all podcast platforms which is called teaching notes that's great comes out every two weeks um a lot of this stuff you can actually get without membership but if you were so, so interested in getting membership of course you'd be very welcome to and the more people with membership the more we can do for the sector um, because it kind of gives us more uh, money essentially to be able to do things and have more staff so it's just 68 pounds a year which um, many schools pay majority of schools do actually pay for their staff um, there's an instrumental option there's an administrator option and for ECTs and PGCs and uh, recently graduated we, it is free for the first year so it's an absolute bargain that's the end of that pitch, but I really, be, your membership would be very welcome. Okay, that brings us to the end of the session today. It's one minute to six. I hope you have a lovely evening. I can take a couple of questions um, if needed. And um, otherwise, have a great rest of your week, a fantastic end to the term. I'm sure you've all got lots of events and things going on. Maybe not as big as what was going on at Worthy Down yesterday, but I'm sure it'll be just as exciting and important to your young people. So all the best with that and good luck with your development plans. Thanks all. Question from Helen, I'll go straight on to that. How do I get the leadership to accept the recommendation of one lesson a week for all key to three when we're working with business, just a recommendation, not compulsory? Right, so the, for me, the offset research review is the one to go to for this. So the offset research review talks about regular provision. So we're not talking about the inspection framework, here is there's um, uh, a document that they published last July, which talks about um, how learning best happens in music. And um, I think that is the one to go to that's got the evidence for it. Um, where else? Offset are also going to be publishing a State of a Nation report. I think they're doing it for all subjects. That will come out in October. And I think that's likely to say to us, well, the great schools look like this. This is what they do. And the schools that aren't doing so well, this is what they do. I don't think it's always good to always use offset forever, like to back us up, but it is useful. Um, you also might want to point out about, you know, do a comparison, maybe what other schools are doing in your local area um, and refer back to the national curriculum um, as well. But I know it's hard and it's, it's tough out there for senior leaders as well. I don't want to give them a hard rap because recruitment is hard, budgets are tight. Um, but if we're not saying this, then who would be my my question? Um, but it's always just kind of um, uh, approaching the issues like how could we get there? Um, how, how could we reach this standard? We really want the best for young people. We really want them to be successful. How can we do it? I'm just having a look if there are any more questions singing charity offer workshops oh wow shiny that sounds awesome reluctance for teachers they're so busy how can it make it easier for schools to partner with us hmm interesting um if you're working nationally that's really hard because you're kind of throwing your net out really wide i've seen the royal opera house have had real success with their singing programs because 
they kind of go from hub to hub and then they've done some hub partnerships. So they've used that as the, the link into schools. Um, or you could go to a multi-academy trust and you could offer it to someone like me and I can run it across my schools. Um, so sometimes like finding those benefits can be useful um, or just like really limit it and restrict it to a certain geographical area, maybe. Um, Ishani, if you get my contact details, I'm happy to have a chat. Maybe not in the next couple of weeks, but um, as we go towards the end of term and I've got a bit more time, I'm really happy to help. Some other questions? Oh yeah, Jonathan's like, free singing workshops? I'm interested. Great, working in London, have some hub partnerships. Well, that sounds like a great start, doesn't it? Um, as long as just getting the message out there um, is is the, the key thing. There is a, um, what was it, music teacher, education conference in October might be a good place to go and talk to people at just networking as well such a key part of it you know um currently on mat leave set Sam hi Sam hope you're all right gosh with a little one at home lots of hard work good for you um worried about time outside of school for enrichment mm, interesting so yeah, so the DfE have got an expectation that schools should be offering a 32 and a half hour week as of next September. So I think that, you know, that stretches the school day. But of course, you know, we have lives and we have to think about workload. Um, and lunch times are getting more and more squeezed. I think that's a post-COVID thing, you know, shorter lunches um, or split lunches. So that's a challenge. But I've seen like that space, that time is a good time to think about it. Um, I know schools who do things during registration time. They might have a music registration group. That's quite progressive because it tends to be um, mixed year groups. But that's something you think about. Um, but also, sometimes I'm always really excited when you see um, uh, enrichment in its broader sense that young people and what they do in the classroom then feeds into co-curricular or feeds into events and performances so that's something to think about as well like if you're teaching singing in year seven well, why can't you get the year sevens together and do a, a whole whole year seven choir slightly mad thing to do but it's always really great in the end um and it's quite what well, they're like, used to in primary school so it's a good point when you can carry that on um so those are some of the kind of um ways i've seen people get around that um in our trust we anticipate that um a school with one teacher could maybe offer two enrichments a school with two teachers could offer three or four enrichments um as a department so something to think about but if your enrichment is a keyboard club that's worth thinking about because you're probably not going to that's not going to turn into a performance so just sometimes be a bit smart about what's being offered as well and maybe think about the keyboard club being done in a different way just a thought okay i'm trying to get all the questions um thames valley oh alex wants to know i might try and if i can link that in the resources afterwards we'll share afterwards okay 40 people are still here these 40 people need to go and have dinner or go and see their families or just chill so i'm going to stop sharing and i'm going to stop the webinar but thank you so much for joining us and um i look forward maybe to our paths crossing at some point maybe even at the mta conference or another event coming up soon have a lovely evening everyone take care